Hello, how are you? Nice to see you. Thank you to DEF CON. Thank you especially to the goons and the other volunteers who are out here busting their humps so we can have such a great time. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I thought I had 50 minutes, I have 45. I'm gonna talk fast. And instead of Q&A, there's a bookseller in the book signing area is bringing in some of my books. You don't have to buy a book, just come over and say hello. I'm gonna sit there until everyone has got a question, uh, has uh, had a chance to ask it. So that's uh, opposite the vendor area gates after this talk, that's the housekeeping here. So I wanna start by asking an important question, which is what the fuck happened to the old good internet? I mean, our bosses were a little surveillance happy, and yeah, they were totally up for sharing their data with the NSA, and if there was ever a toss up between our user security and growth, they always cashed out for YOLO, but Google search, whatever else we could say about it, it worked. And Facebook actually used to give you a feed that shows you the things that you asked to see. Uber used to be cheaper than a taxi and pay the drivers more than a cab driver. Amazon used to actually sell products, not this shine-grade, self-destructing, dropship garbage from brands you've never heard of whose names consist entirely of consonants. <laughs> Apple used to defend your privacy rather than spying on you with a device you're not allowed to modify to turn off the surveillance. There was a time where if you search for an album on Spotify, you'd find the album, not a playlist with the same uh, uh, image and title as the album, but which consists of a bunch of things that someone paid to put in that playlist. Microsoft used to sell you software. Yeah, it was very buggy software, but now they don't even do that. They just let you access apps in the cloud and they watch how you use those apps, figure out which features you value the most, pull them out of the basic rate and sell them back to you as an upsell. What, and I cannot stress this enough, what the fuck happened? So obviously, I am talking about enshittification. And from the outside, here's what enshittification looks like. First, you see a business that's being good to its end users. You know, Google puts the best search results at the top, Facebook shows you a feed of posts from people you asked to follow, Uber charges small dollars for a cab, Amazon subsidizes goods and returns and shipping and puts the best match for your product search at the top of the search results. And that's stage one. That's the part where they're good to end users, but there's a hidden part of stage one, call it like stage 1A, and that's the part where they're figuring out how to lock in those users. So if you're Facebook, the users just do it for you. You joined Facebook because there were people on Facebook you wanted to hang out with. And other people, they joined Facebook because they wanted to hang out with you. That's those old network effects in action. And with network effects come a collective action problem because you love your friends, but God damn are they a pain in the ass. Sure, you all agree that Facebook sucks, but can you agree on when it's time to leave? No way. Can you agree on where to go if you're gonna leave? Hell no. You're, you're there because that's where the support group for your rare disease is hanging out. And your bestie is there because that's where they talk with the people in the country that they moved away from. And then there's that friend who coordinates their kids' little league carpools on Facebook. And the best dungeon master you know is there, and she's not gonna leave because that's where her customers are. So you're stuck because even though Facebook use comes at a high cost to you, your privacy, your dignity, your sanity, it's still less than the switching cost you'd have to endure if you went somewhere else. All those friends who have taken you hostage and who you are also holding hostage. Now, sometimes companies lock you in with money. Amazon gets you to prepay for a year's worth of shipping with Prime and they want to sell you your Audible audiobooks on a monthly subscription, which virtually guarantees that every shopping expedition starts on Amazon because you've already paid for the shipping. Sometimes they lock you in with digital rights management, like HP, who will sell you a printer with four ink cartridges with fluid inside it that retails for more than $10,000 a gallon. So, and then, and using, and they use DRM to stop you from refilling any of those cartridges use, or using a third party cart. So when one cartridge runs dry, you have to refill it or you have to throw away the other three cartridges which are full of liquid that costs more than vintage Co. Sometimes the vendor uses a grab bag of locked in techniques. Like you can't run an iOS app unless you're using Apple hardware. And you can't run the music, the books and the videos you bought from Apple except in an iOS app. That's a happy sound. Uh, can you?
Can we get this mic up? Oh, here we are. Great. We have the technology. Sometimes the vendor is doing this gra grab bag stuff like Apple does. So you need the Apple hardware to run the Apple apps. You need the Apple apps to play the Apple media. And then the phone itself, it uses parts pairing, which is DRM handshakes between subcomponents and the main computer and the device. So you can't use third party parts to fix it. And every part in that device, in your uh, um, uh, iPhone, has got a microscopic Apple logo engraved on it so that if it gets broken up for parts in the Far East and shipped back to the US, they can ask US Customs and Border Patrol to seize it at the border as a trademark violation. That's some real thinking different. So getting you locked in completes phase one of the enshittification cycle, cycle and heralds the beginning of stage two. This is when things are made worse for you as an end user in order to make things better for the business customers that they're making money from. So for example, platforms might poison their search results, like Google, which sells more and more of that results page to ads that are identified with smaller and smaller and grayer and grayer type next to it that says ad. Or Amazon, which sells off its search results, calling this an ad business. They make $38 billion a year selling search placement for your queries so that the first result when you search Amazon on average is 29% more expensive than the best results on Amazon. The first row is 25% more expensive than the best result on Amazon. And that best result is on average 17 places down on that search result page, right? Or the vendor, they'll poison your feed. Uh, like, uh, uh, like Facebook, which started off obviously showing you the things that you asked to see, but the quantum of content from the people that you asked to hear from has dwindled and dwindled to a kind of homeopathic residue, leaving behind a void that can be filled up with things that people will pay to show you. So a lot of that is ads, but a lot of it is boosted posts from publishers that you haven't subscribed to. Those publishers, they have to pay because they can't reach their own subscribers without paying to boost. Now, um, at this point, you might be thinking, sure, if you're not paying for the product, you're the product, but that is bullshit. It is absolute bullshit. The people who buy Google ads, they pay more every year for worse targeting and more ad fraud. Like the publishers who are paying to reach you even though you've subscribed to them. The Amazon sellers with the best match for your query have to outbid everyone else just to be in the first page of results, and it costs so much to sell on Amazon 41 to 51, 45 to 51% of the sale price of everything that you buy on Amazon is being scooped up by Don Bezos and the Amazon crime family. Those, those sellers, they do not have the margin to kick up 45% to Amazon. So they have to raise prices in order to avoid losing money on every sale. But wait, I hear you say. But wait, I hear you say. Things on Amazon aren't more expensive than the things I buy at Target or Walmart or my mom and pop store direct from the vendor. How can they be raising prices on Amazon if the price on Amazon is the same as the price everywhere else? Does anyone want to guess how that works? They raise the prices everywhere else because Amazon binds their sellers to a policy called most favored nation status, which means that the cheapest price they offer has to be matched on Amazon. So they sell more, they charge more everywhere. Now, these sellers are Amazon's best customers. They are paying for the product and they are still getting screwed. Paying for the product does not fill your vapid boss's shriveled heart with so much joy that he decides to stop trying to think of ways to fuck you over. Look at Apple. Remember when Apple offered every iOS user a one-click opt-out for app-based surveillance and 96% of iOS users ticked that box, the other 4% being drunk, confused, or Facebook employees? I mean, this cost Apple 10 billion, or it cost Facebook $10 billion in the first year alone, and we love to see it, but did you know that at the same time, Apple turned on iOS spying that gathered exactly the same data on iOS users for exactly the same purpose for ad targeting for its own ad network and did not give them any way to opt out and lied about it. Uh, now your iPhone is not an ad supported gimme. You paid a thousand fucking dollars for that distraction rectangle in your pocket and you are still the product. What's more, Apple has rigged iOS so that you can't mod the OS to block that spying. If you're not paying for the product, yeah, you're the product. 
But if you are paying for the product, you are still the product. Just ask farmers who shell out six figures for mission critical tractors, but can't actually use their tractors when they swap parts into them after they break down until the manufacturer charges them 200 bucks to send a guy to the end of a lonely country road and type an unlock code into the console. John Deere is not giving away tractors. Give John Deere half million for a tractor and you will be the product. Please, I'm begging you, my brothers and sisters in Christ, please stop saying if you're not paying for the product, you're the product. Okay, so that is phase two of enshittification. Phase one, be good to your users, but lock them in. Phase two, screw those users a little so you can be good to business customers while locking them in because they need those users. Then phase three, Screw everybody and take all the value for yourself. Leave behind the absolute bare minimum of utility so that everyone stays locked into this pile of shit and shitification, a tragedy in three acts. So that is what enshittification looks like from the outside. But what is going on inside the company? What is the pathological mechanism? What sci-fi entropy ray are our bosses aiming at these products to make them so bad so quickly? Well. I call that uh, mechanism twiddling. Twiddling is when someone is altering the back end of a service to change its business operations, to change its prices, its costs, its search ranking, its recommendation criteria, and other foundational aspects of the system. Digital platforms are a twiddler's utopia. A grocer would need an army of teenagers with pricing guns on rollerblades to reprice everything in the store if someone comes in who looks like they're feeling spendy. But McDonald's Investments has a portfolio company called Plexure, and they advertise that they can use surveillance data to figure out when a customer has just been paid and add three bucks to the price of the breakfast sandwich. And, and of course, as the prophet William Gibson told us, Cyberspace is everting. With digital shelf tags, grocers can twiddle prices in real time, like the grocers in Norway, where they're adding these e-ink uh, grocery shelf tags and changing prices up to 2,000 times a day. Now, it's not just grocery stores. Every Uber driver gets offered a different wage for every job. If the driver's been picky lately, the job pays more. But if the driver's been desperate enough to grab every app that the, every uh, job that the app is offering, the pay goes down and down and down. The law professor, Vina Dubel, calls this algorithmic wage discrimination. And it's a prime example of twiddling. And every YouTuber, every TikToker, they know what it's like to be t twiddled. You spend weeks or months working on a video, you spend thousands of dollars, and then the algorithm decides that no one not even your subscribers, not searchers who type in the name of the video will actually see that video. Why? Who knows? The algorithm's rules are not public because content moderation is the only security discipline in which we still say that there is security through obscurity. We can't tell you how the Como algorithm works, otherwise you might figure out how to cheat. YouTube, in other words, is the kind of shitty boss who docks your paycheck every week for violating rules, but won't tell you what those rules are in case you figure out how to break them next week without him docking your paycheck. Now, twiddling also works in some users' favor, of course. Sometimes platforms twiddle things to make things better for some of their uh, end users or business customers. So the best example I know about this comes from the Forbes journalist Emily Baker White who uh, broke a story about how TikTok has a feature on its back end that its strategic managers can use called the heating tool. When a manager applies the heating tool to performer's account, that performer's videos are thrust into the feeds of millions of users uh, without regard to whether or not the recommendation algorithm would uh, uh, organically recommend that to those, uh, to those viewers. Now, why would they do that? Here's an analogy from my, uh, my uh, uh, Dewey boyhood growing up in Toronto. Uh, there was a traveling fair that used to come to Toronto every summer called the Canadian National Exhibition. And if you've been to a fair like the X, you know that uh, you'll always spot some guy on the midway lugging around a giant teddy bear. Uh, nominally, you win those teddy bears by getting five balls in a peach basket. But to a first approximation, no one has ever gotten five balls in a peach basket. That guy won his teddy bear because a carny gestured at him and said, fella, I like your face. I tell you what, you're, what I'm gonna do. You get just one ball in that peach basket. I'll give you a keychain. You get two keychains. I'll let you trade up to the teddy bear. That is how that guy got the teddy bear, which he is now doomed 
to drag up and down the midway all goddamn day. Now, why did the carny give away the teddy bear? Because it turned that guy into a walking billboard for the midway games. If that dopey looking Judas goat can win a giant teddy bear, then maybe you can too, except you can't. TikTok's heating tool is a way to give away extremely tactical giant teddy bears. When someone at the TikTok Brain Trust decides they need more sports bros on the platform, they pick out one bro at random and they make him king for the day. They heat the shit out of his account. That guy gets a bazillion views and he starts running around in all the sports bro forums, trumpeting his success. I am the Louis Pasteur of online sports bro content. The other sports bros pile in and they start retooling to make video that complies with the idiosyncratic requirements of TikTok. And when they fail to get giant teddy bears of their own, they assume it's because they're doing TikTok wrong, because they don't know about the heating tool. But then comes the day when the TikTok star chamber decides that they've got enough sports bros on the platform, so they take the heat off that one lucky sports bro, and maybe they start heating up some lucky astrologer. Giant teddy bears are all over the place. Those Uber drivers who the New York Times lavished so much ink on, who are making $100,000 a year driving for Uber, or the substackers who are rolling in dough, or Joe Rogan's $100 million Spotify playout. Those are all people who are the unwitting recipients of giant teddy bears. And those giant teddy bears are a goddamn bargain because every dollar you spend on a giant teddy bear turns into five or $10 worth of free labor from people who think that they have a shot of earning one of their own. Now, platforms can play games with every part of their business logic in highly automated ways. That allows them to quickly and efficiently siphon value from end users and give it to business customers, from business customers back to end users, and then ba and back again, hiding the P in the shell game uh, at machine speeds until they've got everyone so turned around that they can take all the value, excuse me, they can take all the value for themselves. That's the how. How the platforms do that trick where they are good to users, then they lock those users in, then they take something away from those users and give it to business customers and lock them in, and then they take the value for themselves. So now we know what is happening, we know how it's happening, all that's left is why is it happening? Now, on the one hand, there's an answer to this question that's pretty goddamn obvious. The less value that a business gives to its suppliers, its customers, its workers, the more value there is to left, left to divide among the executives and the shareholders. Companies, uh, but, but uh, that why doesn't tell you why now. After all, companies could have done this shit any time over the last 20 years, but by and large, they didn't. And when they did, uh, they turned themselves into piles of shit and they got treated like piles of shit. We avoided them and then they died. Remember MySpace or you, um, Yahoo Search or LiveJournal? I mean, yeah, you can go to those domains today and find a bunch of AI slop and programmatic ads, but those sites are gone. And there's the clue. It used to be that if you and shitified your product, bad things happened to your company. Now, there are no consequences for unshittification, which is why everyone is doing it right now. So I'll break that down. There are four forces that discipline technology companies. The first one is obviously competition. If your customers find it easy to leave, then you have to worry about them leaving. Now, many factors can contribute to how hard or easy it is to depart a platform. Uh, uh, think of the network effects that Facebook has going for it and the intrinsic cost of going somewhere else and leaving behind the people that you love there. But the most important factor in whether you can leave a platform is whether there's somewhere else to go. Now, remember in 2012, Facebook bought Instagram for a billion dollars. Now, that might seem like chump change in these days of 11-digit big tech acquisitions, but that was a big sum in those innocent days. And it was an especially big sum to pay for Insta. The company had 13 employees, a mere 25 million registered users. But what mattered to Zuck wasn't how many users Insta had, it's where those users came from. Does anyone know where those Insta users were coming from? Facebook, they were leaving Facebook and joining Insta. They were sick of Facebook, even though they liked the people there, they hated creepy Zuck, they hated the platform, and so they left and they didn't come back. So Zuck spent a billion dollars to recapture them. A fact that he put in writing in a midnight email to his CFO, uh, David Ebersman, explaining that he was paying over the odds because his users hated him and they loved Insta. So even if they quit Facebook, the platform, they would still be captured by Facebook 
the company. Now on paper, that acquisition is illegal. Normally that'd be hard to prove because you'd have to prove that Zuck bought them for an anti-competitive purpose. But in this case, Zuck just tripped over his own dick. He actually put it in writing. But Obama's DOJ and Federal Trade Commission, they let it slide. They were following the pro-monopoly policies of Reagan, Bush one, Clinton, and Bush two. Set an example that Trump would follow, greenlighting giga mergers like the catastrophic incestuous Warner Discovery merger that as of this week restated its value down by $10 billion over one year. Indeed, for 40 years, starting with Carter and accelerating through Reagan, the US has encouraged monopoly formation as an official policy on the grounds that monopolies are efficient. If everyone is using Google search, that's something we should celebrate. It means they've got the very best search. And wouldn't it be perverse to spend public funds to punish them for making the best product? But as we all know, Google search did not maintain dominance by being best. They did it by paying bribes. They spend more than $20 billion a year on Apple to be the uh, default iOS search. They spend billions more to be defaults at Samsung, Mozilla, and anyone else making a product or a service with a search box, ensuring that you never stumble on a search engine that's any better than theirs, even if they are, which in turn ensures that no one will ever invest in a superior search engine, even if they are visibly obviously superior, because why bother making something better if Google's buying up all the market oxygen before it can kindle a product to life? Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, they are not making things companies, they are buying things companies. They take advantage of official tolerance for anti-competitive acquisitions, predatory pricing, market distorting exclusivity deals, and other acts specifically prohibited by our antitrust laws. They become too big to fail because that makes them too big to jail, and then they become too big to care which is why Google search is a pile of shit and everything on Amazon is dropship garbage that instantly disintegrates into a cloud of off-gassed volatile organic compounds when you open the box. <laughs> Once companies no longer fear losing your business to a competitor, it is much easier for them to treat you badly because what are you going to do? Remember when Lily Tomlin would be Ernestine, the AT&T operator on those SNL sketches where she'd do ads for the Bell system, and they'd end with, we don't care, we don't have to, we're the phone company. Competition is the first force that serves to discipline companies and the enshittificatory impulses of their leadership. And 40 years ago, we stopped enforcing competition law. Now, it takes an, ex an especially smooth brain type of asshole, that is an establishment economist, to insist that it, the collapse of every single industry from eyeglasses to vitamin C into a cartel of five or fewer companies has nothing to do with the policies that we embraced that deliberately encouraged monopoly formation. It's like we used to put down rat poison and we didn't have a rat problem. And then these dickheads convinced us to stop putting rats down because ra poison down because rats are good for us. We stopped putting the poison down and now rats are eating our faces, and they're all running around saying, who's to say where all the rats are coming from? Maybe it's because we stopped putting down rat poison, but maybe it's just the time of the rats. The great forces of history are bearing down on this moment to multiply rats beyond all measure, and nothing we can do uh, would stop that. Antitrust did not slip down a staircase and fall uh, back first onto a stiletto. They stabbed it in the back, and then they pushed it. And when they killed antitrust, they killed all hope of regulation. Regulation is the second force that disciplines companies. Regulation is possible, but only when the regulator is more powerful than the entities that it regulates. When a company is bigger than the government, it gets damned hard to credibly threaten them uh, uh, it, no matter what crimes they're committing. That's what protected IBM for all those years when it had its boot on the throat of the American tech industry. Do you know that the DOJ fought an antitrust case against IBM from 1970 to 1982? They called it Antitrust Vietnam. And that every year for 12 consecutive years, IBM spent more on lawyers to fight the US Department of Justice Antitrust Division than all the lawyers the US Department of Justice Antitrust Division paid to fight all the cases in America, 12 consecutive years. And that paid off because by 1982, the president was Ronald Reagan, a man whose official policy was that monopolies were efficient, and he dropped the case, and Big Blue wriggled off the hook. 
It's hard to regulate a monopolist. It's hard to regulate a cartel. When a sector is composed of hundreds of competing companies, well, they compete. They genuinely fight with one another. They're trying to poach each other's customers, suppliers, and uh, key employees. They are at each other's throats. It's hard enough to get a couple of hundred, of exec a hundred executives to agree on anything, but when they're legitimately competing with one another, really obsessing about how to eat each other's lunches, they can't agree on anything. The second one of them goes to a regulator with some bullshit story about how it's impossible to build a decent search engine without fine-grained surveillance, or impossible to have a secure and easy-to-use operating system without giving an, uh, 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 veto to the vendor about which apps you run, or how it's impossible to administer an ISP unless you slow down connections to servers that haven't paid for premium carriage, there's gonna be some other company saying, no, that's bullshit. We managed it, here's our logs, here's our quarterly cash books, and here's our customer testimonials, and they prove that these guys are lying. A hundred companies are a rabble, they are a mob. They can't agree on a lobbying position. They're too busy eating each other's lunch to figure out how to cater a meeting where they would discuss a common lobbying position. But let those hundred companies uh, merge to monopoly. Let them absorb one another in an incestuous orgy and turn into five giant companies so inbred they get corporate Habsburg jaws. And they will become a cartel. And it's easy for a cartel to agree on what bullshit they're gonna tell their regulators and to mobilize some of those excess billions that they've reaped through consolidation, which freed them from wasteful competition so that they can capture their regulators completely. You know, Congress used to pass consumer federal privacy laws whenever we got a new technology. Not anymore. The last time Congress managed to sit down and pass a federal consumer privacy law in this country was 1988. The Video Privacy Protection Act, it bans video store clerks from telling newspapers which VHS cassettes you took home. In other words, it regulates three things that no longer exist. The threat of having your video rental history out there in the public eye was not the last or the most important privacy threat we have faced since 1988, and yet Congress has completely failed to pass a privacy law. Tech companies' uh, regulatory capture involves a risible and transparent gambit that is so stupid it's an insult to all those risible, transparent gambits working so hard out there in the world every day. That gambit is that they claim that when they violate your consumer, your privacy, or your labor rights, that it's not a crime because they did it with an app. Algorithmic wage discrimination is not wage theft, we did it with an app. Sp um, spying on you from asshole to appetite, not a privacy violation, we did it with an app. An Amazon scam that tricks people into paying 29% more than the best match for their search, they did it with an app. Once we kill competition, once we stop putting down rat poison, we got cartels. The rats came and ate our faces. And the cartels captured their regulators. The rats bought out the poison factory and they shut it down. So companies are not constrained by competition or regulation. But you know what? This is tech and tech is different. It is different because it's flexible, because our computers are these marvelous things called Turing-complete universal von Neumann machines. And that means that any enshittificatory alteration to a program can be disenshittified with another program. Every time HP jacks up the price of ink, they invite a competitor to make a refill kit or a compatible cartridge. When Tesla installs code that only lets you use half the charge in your battery, they invite a modder to start selling kits to jailbreak your Tesla so you can charge your whole battery. Let me take you through a little example of how this works. Imagine that instead of being here at DEF CON, we're at a product design meeting for our company's website. And the guy leading the meeting puts his hand up and he says, all right, folks, here it is, our KPI is top line ad revenue. I figured out if we make the ads 20% more invasive and obnoxious, we're gonna get 2% more ad revenue. We're all gonna get a ski holiday in Switzerland this year. And one guy sticks his hand up and he says, I love how you think, Elon, but has, <laughs> but has it occurred to you that if we make the ads 20% more obnoxious, then 40% of our users will go to a search engine and type how do I stop seeing ads? I mean, what a nightmare. Because once a user does that, the revenue from that user doesn't rise to the projected 102%. It doesn't stay static at 100%. It goes to zero. It stays there forever. And he guesses why it never comes back? No one ever went back to the search engine and typed, how do I start seeing ads again? 
Once the user jailbreaks their phone or discovers third-party ink or develops a relationship with an independent Tesla mechanic who'll unlock all the DLC in their car, that user is gone forever. Interoperability, that latent property bequeathed to us courtesy of Hare's Turing and von Neumann and their infinitely flexible universal machines is a, is a very serious check on unshittification. The fact that Congress hasn't passed a privacy law since 1988, in part, you can counter that by, uh, uh, with, the with the fact that the majority of web users are now running ad blockers, which are also privacy blockers. But no one's ever installed a tracker blocker for an app. Because reverse engineering an app puts you in jeopardy of criminal and civil prosecution under Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act with penalties of a five-year prison sentence and a $500,000 fine for a first offense. And violating those terms of service puts you in jeopardy under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, a 1986 law that Ronald Reagan was stampeded into passing after watching war games and freaking out. Seriously. Helping others violate the terms of service by giving them a mod? That makes you a tortfeasor engaged in tortious interference with contract. And then there's trademark, copyright, patent, all the nonsense we call IP, but which Jay Freeman from the City of Project calls felony contempt of business model. So we're back at that product planning meeting, and now it's time to talk about our app. And the guy leading the meeting, he says, all right, we're gonna make the ads in the app 20% more obnoxious. And everyone turns to the loudmouth who shot it down last time, and he says, no, no, that's fine, but look, why are we stopping at 20%? Why don't we make the ads 100% more obnoxious and get 10% more revenue? Because we don't care if the user goes and types, how do I stop seeing ads into a search engine? Because you can't. So YOLO, just in shitify away. IP is a euphemism for any law that lets an executive reach outside of the walls of their business and exert control over customers, critics, and competitors. And an app is just a web page skinned with the right kind of IP to make it a felony to put an ad blocker in it. Thank you. Interop used to stop companies from shittifying. If, if companies made their clients suck, someone rolled out an alternative client. If, the, if they ripped out a feature and wanted to sell it back to us as a monthly subscription, someone would make a compatible plugin that worked for a one-time fee or, you know, for free. To help people flee MySpace, Facebook gave them a bot. You gave that bot your login and password for MySpace, it would log in as you several times a day, scrape your waiting messages, put them in your Facebook inbox, and autopilot them back out onto Facebook. So you didn't have to choose between the people you loved who were on MySpace and Facebook, which had promised that it would never spy on you. Do you remember that? Now, thanks to the metastasis of IP, all of that is off the table today. Apple owes its very existence to the iWork suite, pages, numbers, Keynote, which are file fo compatible with uh, Microsoft Office, Word, uh, Excel, and PowerPoint. But make an iOS runtime that plays back the files you bought from Apple stores on other platforms, and they will nuke you till you glow. Facebook wouldn't have had a hope of breaking MySpace's grip on social media without that scraper, but scrape Facebook today in support of an alternative client, and their lawyers will bomb you until the rubble bounces. Google scraped every website in the world to create a search index. Try and scrape Google and your head will be on a pike. When they did it, that was progress. When you do it, that is piracy. Every pirate wants to be an admiral. And because this handful of companies has so thoroughly captured their regulator, they can wield the power of the state against you when you try to break their grip on power, even as their own flagrant violations of our rights go unpunished because they do them with an app. Tech lost its fear of competition. It neutralized the threat from its regulators, and then it put those regulators in harness to attack new startups who might do unto them as they did unto everyone who dominated before them. But even then, there was one force that still kept our bosses in check, and that was us. That was tech workers. Tech workers have historically been in very short supply, and that gave us power, and our bosses knew it. They, to get us to work crazy hours, they came up with a trick. They appealed to our love of technology. They told us we were heroes of the digital transformation, that we would organize the world's information and make it useful, that we would bring the world closer together. They brought in expert set dressers to turn our workplaces into whimsical campuses with free laundry, gourmet cafeterias, massages, kombucha, and a surgeon on hand who would freeze your eggs 
so you could work through your fertile years. They convinced us that we were being pampered rather than being tricked into working like government mules. Now that trick, it has a name. Fobazi Etar, the librarian, she calls it vocational awe, but Elon Musk just calls it being extremely hardcore. And it, and it worked well. We did put in some long ass hours, but for our bosses, this trick failed badly. Because if you miss your mother's funeral in order to hit some deadline, and then your boss orders you to enshittify the product you missed the funeral for, you are going to experience a profound moral injury, which you are absolutely gonna make your boss very aware of. Because what are they gonna do, fire you? They can't hire someone else to do your job, and the guy across the street will pay you just as much. So workers, we held the line when competition, regulation, and interoperability failed but supply caught up with demand. Last year, they fired 260,000 tech sector workers. First six months of this year was another 100,000. You can't tell your bosses to go fuck themselves because they'll fire your ass and give your job to someone else who will be happy to enshittify the product you sweated blood to ship. That's why all this is happening right now. Our bosses are not different. They did not catch a mind virus that turned them into greedy assholes who don't care about our users' well-being or the quality of our products. As far as our bosses are concerned, they have, uh, th the point of that business was to charge the most, deliver the least, and share as little as possible with suppliers, workers, and customers in order to retain money for shareholders and executives. They are not running charities. Since day one, our bosses have reported for work every morning, grabbed the giant lever behind their desk labeled in shittification, and pulled on it as hard as they could. But the lever didn't move much. It was gummed up by competition, by regulation, by interoperability, by the tech workforce. And as those sources of friction melted away, that in shittification lever started moving pretty freely. Now that sucks, I know, but think about this for a sec. Our bosses, despite being wildly imperfect vessels, capable of rationalizing endless greed and cheating, nevertheless made a series of actually great products and services, not because they were better people then, but because they were subject to discipline. So it follows that if we want to end the Inshita scene, if we want to dismantle the Inshitternet, if we want to build a new good internet that our bosses can't wreck, we need to make sure that those constraints are durably installed on our new internet, wound around its roots and nerves. And we have to stand guard over those forces so that they can't be dismantled again. A new good internet is one that has the positive aspects of the old good internet, the ethic of technological self-determination, where users of technology and the hackers, the tinkerers, the startups, and the others who serve as their proxies can reconfigure the technology to make it work so that it does what they need it to do and cannot be used against them. But the new good internet has to fix the defect of the old good internet, the part that made it hard for anyone who wasn't us to figure out how to use it. And hell yeah, we can do that. Tech bosses swear that this is impossible. You can't have a conversation with a friend without Zuck being present. You can't search the web without letting Google scrape you down to your viscera. You can't have a phone that works reliable, uh, reliably without Apple getting a veto over your software. They claim that it's nonsense to even ponder this proposition. It's like making water that's not wet, but that is bullshit. We can have nice things. We can build for the people we love and give them a place worthy of their time and attention. To do that, we have to install constraints. The first constraint, remember, it's competition. We are living through an epochal shift in competition policy. After 40 years of antitrust enforcement in an induced coma, a wave of antitrust vigor has swept through governments all over the world. Regulators are stepping up to ban monopolistic practices, to open up walled gardens, to block anti-competitive mergers, and even unwind the corrupt mergers that were undertaken on false pretenses. Now, normally this is the part in this speech where I'd listed all the amazing things that have happened over the past four years. The enforcement actions that block companies from becoming too big to care and that scared companies away from even trying. Like Wiz, which just noped out of the largest acquisition offer in world history, turning down Google's $23 billion buyout and deciding to, you know, just be a fucking business that makes money by making a product that people want that is sold at a competitive price. Normally, I'd be listing out FTC rulemakings here, or the ban non that ban non-competes worldwide, uh, or the new merger guidelines that the FTC and the DOJ cooked up, which, among other things, make privacy something that has to be considered in mergers. 
I had a whole section of this stuff in my notes, an absolute victory lap, but I deleted it this week. Does anyone know why I deleted it this week? Anyone want to guess? All right, this week, Judge Amit Mehta, ruling for the DC Circuit of these United States of America in the docket 20-3010 in a case known as United States versus Google LLC, found that Google is a monopolist and it has acted as a monopolist to maintain its monopoly and ordered that Google and the DOJ propose a schedule for a remedy like breaking the company up. So yeah, that was pretty fucking epic. Now, this antitrust stuff is esoteric, and I'm not going to shame you if you want to keep a little distance on the subject. Nearly everyone is an antitrust normie, and that's fine. But if you're a normie, you're probably only catching little bits and pieces of this narrative. And let me tell you, the monopolists know that, and they are flooding the zone with shit. The Wall Street Journal has published 100 editorials condemning Lena Kahn, the chair of the Federal Trade Commission, for doing nothing and getting nothing done with public funds. Anyone out there know who owns the Wall Street Journal? No. Rupert Murdoch. Rupert Murdoch. Do you really think Rupert Murdoch pays his editorial board to write 100 op-eds about someone who's not getting anything done? The reality is that in the United States, in the UK, in the EU, in Australia, in Canada, in China, in Japan, in South Korea, we are seeing more antitrust action over the past four years than over the preceding 40. And remember, the competition law is pretty robust. The problem's not the law, it's the enforcement priorities. Reagan put them in mothballs 40 years ago. But that is an elegant weapon from a more civilized age, and it has found its way into the hands of people who sure know how to use it. And they are swinging for the fences. So next up is regulation. As the seemingly inescapable power of the tech giants is revealed as the sham that we always suspected it was, governments and regulators are finally gonna kill the one weird trick of violating the law but saying it's okay because we did it with an app. In the EU, they've got the new Digital Markets app that requires dominant platforms to open up APIs so that you can move easily between services. And that's a very cool rule, but what's even cooler is how it's gonna be enforced. Previous EU rules, they were called regulations, which meant that they had to be turned into law in each EU member state. Um, and for big tech, that meant that all uh, enforcement of laws like the General Data Privacy Protection Regulation started in Ireland, where they all pretend to be headquartered. And they pretend to be headquartered in Ireland because Ireland is a tax haven, and so they fly Irish flags of convenience. But here's the thing. If it, every tax haven has to be a crime haven, because any company that is footloose enough to pretend to be Irish this week could pretend to be Maltese or, or uh, Luxembourgian or uh, Cypriot next week, so to keep those footloose criminal enterprises happy, they have to stop enforcing their laws. That's why the GDPR is such a goddamn joke in practice, because the only way to get these companies held to account for their GDPR policies is to go after them in Ireland, where the Irish data commissioner barely gets out of bed, and when they do, they usually spend most of the day in their pajamas eating breakfast cereal in front of the television. Now, all of this is hardly a secret. The European Commission knows that it's going on. So with the DMA, the Commission starts all of the, regu all of the enforcement in the federal courts, which have no uh, way in which they are beholden to these big uh, tech companies. In other words, the we, vote pri we violate privacy law, excuse me, we violate privacy law, uh, that work, uh, but it's okay because we did it with an app that worked for so many years, it's now a dead letter. And here in the US, the uh, dam is finally breaking on getting a federal privacy law for us. It's been a minute. And the thing is, there are a lot of people who are very angry about how poor privacy law is in America. Not because they're worried about privacy, but because they're worried about other stuff. Maybe Grampy uh, was on Facebook and you think that's how he became a QAnon. Or you think maybe Insta made your teen anorexic. Or you're worried that cops rolled up all the demonstrators at that Black Lives Matter demonstration using Google location data. Or you're worried that they did it to the January 6th rioters. Or that you're worried that red state attorneys general follow teenagers across state lines into abortion clinics. Or you're worried that black people are being discriminated against in lending and job applications. Or that someone made AI uh, deepfake porn of you. A federal privacy law with a private right of action would do something about all of those problems. That makes a very big coalition for privacy law, which is why we're seeing a procession of imperfect but steadily improving privacy laws working their way through Congress. 
So I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. If you sign up for our list at EFF.org, we're gonna send you emails when those laws come up. And you can call up your Congress jerk or your Senator, and you can talk to them about it. You can make an appointment to drop by their offices when they're in their home district and explain to them that you're not just a registered voter from their districts, that you're the kind of tech person who goes to DEF CON. And then you can explain the bill to them. And that stuff makes a difference. So how about self-help? How are we doing on making interoperability legal again? I'm, I'm nearly done. Two minutes, sorry. My mic stopped working for a minute. Uh, how, how are we doing on making, I'm seriously almost done, stop clapping so I can finish. Uh, how are we doing on making interoperability legal again? Well, we got these state right, right to repair bills that ban parts pairing, that ban using DRM for parts. Uh, these bills are pushed by a fantastic group of organizations called the Repair Coalition at repair.org, and they'll email you when one of these bills are going through your state house, and you can meet with your state reps and explain to the JV squad what you just explained to your federal reps. And the prime mover behind repair.org is iFixit, and iFixit's founder, Kyle Weens, is here at DEF CON. So when you see him, shake his hand, thank him for his service, but tell him you've signed up for the mailing list as well. Now on to that last uh, workforce and my last page, I promise. Uh, uh, the, the thing that used to stop tech bosses from going bad, and that's you, the tech workforce. For years, your bosses tricked you into thinking you were founders and waiting, temporarily embarrassed entrepreneurs, momentarily drawing a salary, not workers. Your power came from intrinsic virtue, not, those lazy, not like those lazy slobs in their unions. Now that was a trick and you got scammed. The power you had came from scarcity, so when scarcity ended, your indus the industry, when the industry started ringing in six-figure layoffs, your power went away. The only durable source of power for tech workers is as workers in unions. Think about Amazon. Think, hold on, I gotta finish, stop clapping. Uh, Think about Amazon. Warehouse workers have to piss in bottles and have the highest rate of on-the-job uh, injuries of any uh, comparable company in the industry. Whereas Amazon coders get to show up for work with facial piercings, green mohawks, and black t-shirts that say things their bosses don't understand. They can piss whenever they want to. That's not because Jeff Bezos loves tech workers. It's because they're scared you'll quit and they won't be able to replace you. Another Will and Gibson quote, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. You know who lives in the future? Amazon warehouse workers. They are living in your future. Drivers whose eyeballs are monitored by AI cameras that do phrenology uh, on their faces to figure out when, when to dock their pay, and warehouse workers whose bodies are ruined in a matter of months. As tech bosses beef up this reserve army of unemployed skilled tech workers, those tech workers, you folks, will arrive at the same future as them. Look, I know you spent your careers explaining in words so small your boss could understand them that you refuse to enshittify your company's products. And I thank you for your service, but if you want to go on fighting for the user, you need power that's better than scarcity. You need a union. Want to learn how? Check out the Tech Workers Coalition and Tech Solidarity and get organized. And shitification is not here because our bosses changed. They were always that guy. They were always yanking the lever. What changed was the environment, everything that kept the shitification switch from moving. And that is good news because it means that we can have good products with imperfect people. A new good internet is in our grasp, an internet with the technological self-determination of the old good internet and the grease skid simplicity of Web 2.0 that let normie friends get in on the fun. Tech bosses want you to think that UX and shitification can't be separated, and that is self-serving bullshit. We know it because we built the old good internet, and we've been fighting a rearguard action to preserve it over the past two decades, and it's time to stop playing defense and go on the offense. To restore competition, to restore regulation, interoperability, and tech worker power so that we can create a new good internet that we're going to need to fight fascism, the climate emergency, and genocide. To build a digital nervous system for the 21st century in which our children will thrive and prosper. Thank you. All right. I'm going, I'm going to the signing area. It's, it's uh, outside the Huckster's room. Come and say hello.